Thanks, David. Tim Opitz is general counsel for Renew Missouri. Prior to joining Re Renew Missouri, Tim served as chief deputy counsel for the Missouri Office of the Public Counsel. He also worked as an attorney for the staff of the Missouri Public Service Commission, the PSC. Tim earned his law degree from the University of Arkansas School of Law in 2012 and his BA from Rockhurst University in, 20, in 2009. Um, Philip Frasica is Renew Missouri's Director of Programs. He graduated from the University of Missouri with the Bachelor of Science in Business Administration in 2015. Philip has worked at Renew Missouri in various capacities since then. He currently serves on the Missouri Weatherization Policy Advisory Council and recently served on the CWL IRP Task Force. And I wasn't able to determine what that was, so I'll have to ask him to explain those acronyms for us. Welcome, Tim and Philip. Thank you for having us. Um, I'm going to try and share my screen here. We've got a slide deck. Let's see, share screen. And while he's doing that, just to let you know, uh, it's Columbia Water and Lights Integrated Resource Plan Task Force, and Councilman Scala uh, allowed me to serve on there. So thank you for that, sir. Um, and we just wrapped that up after a three-year process. Thank you. I never would have guessed that, I don't think. <laughs> okay, are folks able to view the slide deck that's on there now? I am. Thank you. Um, so again, my name is Tim Opitz. Thank you for having me. I'm joined by Philip Frasica with Renew Missouri as well. We're both uh, out of our Columbia office now. Philip was in our Kansas City office for a few years. Um, James sends his regrets. He had something come up. Uh, James Owen is our executive director and uh, Philip Nice boss. And so he deputized us to talk to you all today about Energy 101. In Missouri. Um, so here are the few things we're going to talk about. Um, just a very, very high level overview of utility regulation in the United States, in Missouri, uh, representing interest at the legislature, uh, the Missouri legislature that is, are Missouri's clean energy laws. And then uh, we've got one slide about some challenges that are ongoing now and next steps. Uh, who are we? Uh, Renew Missouri is a nonprofit. Um, some of you know us and our supporters. Uh, we were founded in 2006. PJ Wilson uh, was our founding member, um, and he stepped away a few years ago and James stepped in. Um, our mission is to advance renewable energy and energy efficiency in the state of Missouri. Primarily, we do that through litigation before the Public Service Commission, which I'll talk about in a, in a moment here. Um, we do that with our limited lobbying before the Missouri legislature. And we do that uh, through engaging with municipal utilities um, and more frequently with our uh, rural electric co-ops here. Um, we also do a number of uh, miscellaneous things such as supporting homeowners who'd like to put solar on their homes that has an HOA that's stopping them from doing that. Um, we engage with uh, folks who are supporting different initiatives um, in their uh, municipalities or with their co-ops to try and give them the resources they need or the information they need to help them make the case for renewable energy or energy efficiency. Um, uh, again, you've heard this. That's myself and Philip. Um, if uh, you want to know, know more about us, you can reach out, but I'll skip past that. Um, so at, at a high step nationally, um, with electric and generally utility markets, we have uh, regulated and deregulated utilities. So a regulated would be like, uh, I guess that's the shorthand for a vertically integrated monopoly. And that's what we have in Missouri. So they cover the generation, 
the transmission and the distribution of power. And then they sell it, uh, dis distribution meaning they sell it to retail customers, such as you know, folks in, in your home or, or a grocery store or even an industrial customer. Um, the way that works is a utility is granted a certain geographic area where they are the sole provider of power. Um, and in that way, I guess the theory from 100 years ago, and, and that's still true today, is it avoids economic waste when there are things that competition might be destructive and add costs, um, the state has granted utility status or uh, monopoly status to utilities. Um, the big thing here is customers can't choose who their provider is, but typically there are boards or courses of recourse to um, seek a way to address your grievances. Um, a deregulated market um, has sort of been a recent phenomenon. I would say it got started in the early 80s, um, back when there was a lot of uh, different change in political philosophy, I would say. And they essentially have broken up the vertically integrated monopolies. Uh, an example is Illinois, where the generation utilities are owned by one company that then sell it to distribution utilities that are separate. And so the customers there, to a certain degree, can choose which distribution uh, uh, supplier they choose to go with. Um, there are also transmission companies in there that maintain the grid. Um, so that's, that's just a very high level overview. Uh, I know it's a lot to take in. This is kind of a very rudimentary graphic talking about that. Um, the different steps in there. In the top one, it's like Missouri uh, and one company, say Ameren, Missouri or Evergy owns all of that. In the bottom example, you have different uh, companies owning at the different levels. This is a map of the US with the different uh, status of regulated markets. Um, I think there are, uh, it's about 50-50 with the electric regulated versus restructured or deregulated markets right now. Um, there's been pushes um, at various times to get Missouri to restructure. I know in the late 90s, early 2000s, Ameren, Missouri was a a uh, big pusher at the legislature to try and deregulate Missouri. Uh, since then, that's cooled down. And just my conversations with folks at Ameren, it's they make more money in the vertically integrated model. When they were pushing it, they were making more money in the deregulated model, but now they make more money with less risk in Missouri. So uh, that's why they're not pushing it anymore. Uh, so in Missouri, we have um, the Missouri Public Service Commission. I know most of you folks are in Columbia or around Columbia, so you are uh, not necessarily regulated by the Missouri Public Service Commission. Um, your gas might be if you're an Ameren gas customer for natural gas. Your electric is probably through the city of Columbia or Boone Electric Power. Um, but if you were regulated by the Public Service Commission, um, they regulate electric, natural gas, water, and sewer utilities for these investor-owned monopolies. Um, the commission does have some jurisdiction over telephones still, although it's very, very, very limited, basically to assigning um, uh, new phone numbers um, and number of extensions. Uh, the commission is just a huge, um, I'll say, uh, technical staff. They've got about 200 technical staff in uh, split between Jeff City, St. Louis, and Kansas City. There are five commissioners who are basically the judges and the juries in all of these cases. Um, they're appointed by the governor and confirmed by the Senate. Typically, there is a split between partisan and the governor in power gets to pick three people who are from his party, um, and then there's two people in the minority party. 
unlike some positions on boards, that's not statutory, that's mostly been by tradition, but I think um, utility regulation has generally been nonpartisan, so I think that will continue. Uh, a brief history, it was formed in 1913, uh, and this was about the same time as most states nationally were developing public utility commissions. Um, again, electricity was relatively new. Uh, there were, at the time, sort of competing uh, utilities developing and building out different transmission lines and distribution lines and really clogging things up. So the legislatures in most states decided the way to approach that was just to award a monopoly for certain areas to a single utility to avoid duplication of infrastructure. Um, I won't get into those other details. So in Missouri, um, we have about, uh, I think the census was, we have about 6 million people here. About 75% of those people is our estimate are served by investor owned utilities. Uh, the largest being Ameren, Missouri in the St. Louis area and some in Columbia for gas and some electric up near Excelsior Springs. Uh, Evergy is Kansas City area and St. Joe and Liberty Empire is down near Joplin and thereabouts. Um, municipal utilities, city utilities, Columbia Water and Light and Independence Power and Light are three big ones. And then of course, we've got our rural electric co-ops. Um, personally, I am a Boone Electric Co-op member. Um, some of you probably are as well, but co-ops have sort of a different structure where they're elected. Um, this is a map of the service areas. Uh, again, it's, you know, kind of broad. I mean, you know, you see Boone County there is yellow for Union Electric or Ameren. That is, um, true for gas, but not necessarily true for um, electric. Our gas utilities, um, Spire used to be Laclede out of St. Louis. A couple of years ago, they bought Alagasco, which is Mississippi and Alabama natural gas company. Um, and so that Spire became basically a Fortune 500 company. Uh, and then they merged with MGE out of Kansas City. And so now Spire is the largest natural gas supplier in Missouri. Amher, Missouri also has some natural gas supply, mainly in Columbia. And then Summit Natural Gas serves some areas um, north of Kansas City um, and kind of down by the lake, like the Ozarks that is. Um, but, so they're, they're a little bit smaller, but Spire is the big dog there. Water utilities, Missouri American Water is very large. Um, we've got some municipal utilities, um, St. Louis and Kansas City. Um, since the majority of, I'll say the population of Missouri are served by IOUs, I'm gonna talk a little about how the Public Service Commission sets rate cases and the things they decide. Um, generally, they have um, I, I, I don't want to, I think plenary is too far, but they have very broad jurisdiction over the operations uh, and permission that these utilities get to operate, um, mostly in terms of how they account for things, what they can construct, and then how much they can charge customers. Um, the main cases we deal with are general rate cases. Those uh, take 11 months. The utilities on average right now are filing every 18 months for a rate increase. Usually it averages, they ask for about 10% increase and usually the commission knocks that down to about seven. And that's very general, but, and you know, sometimes they give them what they ask for, but um, that's just been the experience in the last 10 years I've worked in this area. Um, the integrated resource plan, uh, that's something that a lot of utilities throughout the country are doing. Missouri investor-owned utilities have done it for a lot longer than many people. Um, I think it was the 
mid 2000s, they really started doing that in robust. And basically it's a process where the utility makes a filing explaining what their resource acquisitions strategy is for the next 20 year planning period. And that's updated every three years. And so what I mean by that is they will look at the expected usage of customers uh, for that 20 year period, whether it's gonna grow like right now, um, for the last few decades, it's been relatively stable. The growth in electric usage, uh, it's a couple percent a year, um, but some of the utilities now are modeling that growth is going to shoot through the roof in anticipation of widespread adoption of electric vehicles, which will again, create a lot more power usage. So that's kind of a new twist in resource planning now um, that really has kind of been sort of very flat for the, for the past few decades. Um, and really what happens there is they make a filing, they say, we're gonna expect this, this growth or um, we've got this expected um, you know, emissions restriction, CO2 price maybe, and that's gonna change how we're gonna provide power. So we might retire a coal plant or we might add solar or wind or we might start looking at battery storage. Um, that's very high overview of the IRP plan process, but um, that's kind of what happens there. CCNs, Certificate of Convenience and Necessity, is another big case that we get involved in. And that's basically to support utility or encourage them to build renewable resources. Whenever they want to add generation, uh, such as a wind farm or a solar field, they have to seek permission from the Public Service Commission to do that in advance. So we are supportive of that. And so we get involved in those cases. Um, there's other miscellaneous things, rulemaking, which are the regulations adopted by the state, workshop cases, which are kind of a step before rulemaking, where parties put forward ideas about emerging issues, different things that uh, will be upcoming and new approaches to uh, provide power to people. And then there's complaints, you know, some people who might get shut off when they shouldn't have been shut off, or there's an issue with their meter, different things like that um, are processed before the Public Service Commission. We don't really get involved with complaints at Renew Missouri, but um, I've done that a lot in my prior uh, jobs. Um, at the PSC, um, it's kind of a unique um, legal atmosphere, uh, given that, you know, when you think of a case, you usually, in a civil case, you have a plaintiff, a defendant, and that's it. You might have multiple defendants, a couple of them. Criminal case, you've got the prosecutor, you've got the defendant. Um, so it's kind of, you know, a few parties. At the PSC, you might have up to 20 parties in some cases. So it gets complicated pretty fast. Um, the typical parties are the utility, the Office of Public Counsel, which is a statutory body that represents ratepayer interests. Uh, the staff of the commission is a statutory party. They're a party in all cases. They're supposed to be kind of neutral in all these cases. And then the Division of Energy will sometimes get involved. Then you have consumer groups, um, various companies. Uh, one big example, and they've since uh, gone out of business was Naranda, which is an aluminum smelter down the boot hill. Uh, but they would get involved in a lot of these rate cases to try and keep their power rates low. Um, uh, 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 other groups that get involved are uh, industry associations like uh, Midwest Energy, Energy, Midwest Industrial Energy Group, and Midwest Energy Consumers Group. Uh, which represent various large power customers um, who normally go otherwise unrepresented um, because the staff is neutral. OPC typically looks out for residential customers. Sometimes municipalities uh, intervene in these cases because they're large power customers. Like City of St. Joe is a power customer from uh, Evergy. Um, there's a couple others out there. And then there's advocates like Renew Missouri, Sierra Club, uh, Natural Resource Defense Council, Messia. Sometimes there's low-income advocates like Missouri Consumers Council. 
Um, so basically, whenever there's a case, all of those parties intervene. They're granted intervention. They put forward witnesses. They make legal arguments. Um, and then the commission decides on what a, a just and reasonable outcome is there. Um, a rate case is definitely the biggest thing that the Public Service Commission does. Uh, the way it works is a utility can't collect money until they've spent it. So they can't say, we're gonna build a, a natural gas plant, for example, uh, in five years. So we're gonna start charging everybody a dollar extra a month. They can't do that. They've gotta make the investment first. And then they come in, they file a rate case, they say, We've invested an extra uh, $2 billion building this natural gas plant. Uh, it's gonna have a six year life. We have this many customers, they use this much. Here's how much we think we should allocate that cost over. Um, the different interveners will say their piece about whether that's reasonable, whether it is justified. Um, and then the commission will decide after testimony, a hearing, and legal briefing. Sometimes parties appeal, um, but in my experience, um, the commission usually wins on appeal given the deferential nature our courts give to our administrative bodies here. Um, okay, so I guess I, I'll, we have questions at the end, but I'm going to transition to a different section here. Does anybody have questions about the um, uh, uh, Public Service Commission and how that works? Um, I have a question about one of the things that you mentioned about utilities not being able to charge customers in advance for new construction. And I understand there have been attempts to change that in the past, is that a current issue or are they just able to borrow money elsewhere? I see Phillips nodding vigorously. So, so yeah, that is a current issue um, right now, our investor owned utilities. And, and so I'm not, when I say that limit, I'm not talking about our municipalities or our co-ops, they're governed by different regulations, but for uh, our investor owned utilities, Amber and Ever, G-Spire, they are limited by, and I think it was called Amendment 1, but it was in the, I believe it was 1976 it passed. And that was uh, around the time Ameren, Missouri was building the Callaway nuclear reactor. Uh, and they were charging customers before it was built for that. Uh, there was a lot of litigation that went around it. People in St. Louis's bills went up a lot. Uh, because nuclear reactors are very expensive. And you know, I'm talking, at, you know, at the time it was in the billions, but now I think that the most recent nuclear reactor that's still in construction in the US um, is about $11 billion over budget. Um, so that it was budgeted in the billions and they're 11 billion over. So they're very expensive. Um, so, but that led to a huge backlash. There was a ballot issue and uh, they call it the, um, we call it construction work in progress. It's kind of an accounting framework that says, you know, while it's work in progress, you can record it on your books and defer it, but you can't collect on that until later on. Um, and then that later on being the commission can look at and say, look, you overpaid for this. You weren't prudent in this decision, that sort of thing. But you appropriately point out that that has uh, been an issue recently. It is in a bill that is currently before the legislature that I'll touch on later that talks about that. We have a couple of other hands raised. Uh, tell, uh, Sue and Herb Telema. I can see Herb talking, but I can't hear him. There, you can hear me, Herb Tillema. Sue has a question to follow, mine is short, I think. I got confused the get-go between the different and the difference between regulated and deregulated markets. 
Texas is shown on your map as a uh, deregulated market. Coincidentally, electricity for electricity. And um, coincidentally, electricity in Texas is produced in Texas and not exported, as I understand it. This is apparently accomplished without regulation. Or is it a special, as somebody judge called it yesterday, Humpty Dumpty jargon? Or is it that this is a private conspiracy among the um, participants in the market? So oh, deregulated isn't, um, it's not what somebody at like the Cato Institute would, would dream of, right? No regulation, total, just whatever, let the market decide. Deregulation means uh, in this context that there aren't a vertical monopoly on the generation, transmission, distribution of electric power. This and is so specialized Texas, selective jargon that I understand now, okay? Yeah. Okay, and, yeah. and my question is a little different or a comment, partly a comment. Uh, thank you for being there to help serve the general public and we really appreciate that. But in addition, <clears throat> I worked in Jeff City for some time and the kind of the climate that you felt from what you heard about on the Public Service Commission was the um, utilities had could spend huge money on presenting their case. And as far as the main group presenting the other side was public counsel, which I don't think at the what I remember, I doubt it was over 10, 12 people and and not, you know, not high powder. And so that's kind of very lopsided. Absolutely. Um, I will say I worked at the commission staff. Um, I worked at uh, Office of Public Council for about four years before joining Renew Missouri. And I think at the largest, our office was um, tw about 12 people. Um, the, there was a period, I think in the 80s, that they were up to about 20 people, but they've really only been about 12 people. And I think now they're even down to about maybe 10. Uh, right now, um, and the one of the one of the I'll say uh, advantages disadvantages of of the recent two years or so was um, the way things are funded. Right, the utility when they file their rate case, they can include rate case expense, basically paying their witnesses, paying their lawyers, and then they collect that from all of their customers as a cost of doing service, right? But it's built into your rates that you pay. Uh, a couple of years ago, uh, when I was at OPC, we successfully argued that the company should have to pay for some of that before they were getting 100% pass through. So now, and the courts have upheld it, the commission has generally applied, only awarded about half of their costs that they spend so that there is some limit. So that is an improvement in the past five years or so. In the past two years or so, there's been a huge step backwards in how the OPC has been funded. The commission staff is funded by uh, basically your utility bill. And so that 200 people in the commissioners, their salary is paid for in the money you pay on your bill each month. It's just baked into there. Um, the OPC used to be like that, um, but it wasn't, through a statute. It was through an executive order that Jay Nixon had issued. Now, Spire had always paid that amount under protest um, because they thought it should be appropriated by the General Assembly, um, that money for the OPC. Um, once Jay Nixon left office, uh, Spire re-upped its challenge of that and ultimately the OPC for the past few years has been funded from the general revenue, which puts its budget at risk every single year. Whereas before it did have some certainty that they were gonna be funded. So that's a big step backwards, right? So there is a, um, uh, a battle between resources and the ability to fight for different sides right now. Um, I think that the rate case expense uh, allocation served to advance uh, 
ratepayers, customers' interests, whereas defunding the Office of Public Counsel and moving it to the General Assembly um, and the whims of the legislators there has been a detriment to them. But so far, you know, they've held their own and they've managed to keep fighting. I, I do know and I'm close with several people who still work there. And I know it's stressful um, to be sort of towing that line of uh, uh, you, you want to advocate what you can, but if you go too far, there's always the op opportunity for um, some legislator to try and cut your budget, right? So it's a balance that they have right now. And, and I wish there was legislation that would, um, uh, you know, remedy that, but, you know, <laughs> it, it, it's hard to get anything through right now. I mean, you, you all are politically involved. You've seen that the legislature has kind of been at a standstill um, about redistricting even, you know, so um, it's a give and take there. Thank you. Looks like Lyra might have a question. So. Yes, Tim. Um, I recently received a constituent email uh, asking what recourse they have for large AMRIN rate increases. That happened, I guess, about December um, was what they stated. Uh, in recouping costs that maybe were from Texas, and they have um, really, where can a constituent go to get support? And who is an advocate for these rate payers? Yeah, so sounds like it was a residential customer. Yes. Um, so, and I'm, I'm guessing it was Ameren Gas in Columbia or thereabouts, yes. maybe Ashland. So um, taking a step back, just the context of that was Winter Storm Uri, I think it was last March, maybe last February now. Um, basically, it was a deep freeze in Texas. Um, if you're a uh, Republican from Texas, you say it was caused by wind freezing. If you are a sane person, you say it was their natural gas lines that froze. Um, and I guess beg your pardon for the editorial comment, but uh, so uh, essentially there was a huge shortage of power and due to the structure of Texas's grid, they are not connected to a, a different RTO. So they've kind of got a standalone network there. There are a few electric seams, we call them, where the power lines hook up so they could get power or gas from other areas. Um, but basically, due to that cold weather, and we were having cold weather here, so everybody's gas supplies uh, were being stretched thin. And so supply and demand, the price went way up. And there were people who had contracts that they couldn't fill. And so there were treble penalties assessed against them. Um, and so a lot of money. I know there were a lot of municipalities. City of Fulton was one where they had just huge uh, debts that they racked up due to Storm Uri for gas costs. The legislature did pass a um, emergency bill last year that would give some additional funding to allow municipalities to pay for these debts, but that doesn't really help out our investor-owned utilities or their customers. Um, so that's just sort of the background, right? And so basically there was this huge increase in prices because of that storm. The utilities, um, as they try to do, they pass that cost on to customers. Um, most of that was, well, I won't get into the different accounting cases that went on, but basically they preserved their expenses and they were able to try and recover them from customers. Um, Gas is a little different. They have a PGA, so your usage is different than your fixed charge. Um, and I'm sorry for <laughs> being so technical in this, but uh, yeah, so, so basically there's this cost that you've got to pay and it's how they're going to collect it. Um, the way that the regulators have looked at that is, is they've said, we're going to let them collect it, but we're going to stretch it out over a longer period of time than we otherwise would to try and make it more uh, acceptable to people and to not bankrupt people. That might not always be the case, but that's what they've tried to do. So the advocates for individual customers are the commission staff, 
uh, and psc.mo.gov is uh, a good resource where they can find a phone number to call in consumer services, which is the public facing portion. They can file a complaint um, as an individual with the commission. Um, and, and there are people at the staff who will talk you through how to do that. Um, so psc.mo.gov is a good resource. And then there's opc.mo.gov. And OPC is the, I call it the residential advocate. And so they've been involved in these cases. Um, they are involved and they are looking out the best they can subject to funding constraints um, for residential customers, um, regardless of whether they contact the office or not. But if a customer really has an issue, um, I know when I was at OPC, I would field probably, you know, a dozen or so calls a week from people and try and talk uh, through things and try and get them in contact with the right uh, people at the utility because they do have programs that can assist with bill payment and rearages, that sort of thing. So I hope that answers your question. That's kind of a long-winded way of, of saying the OPC represents uh, residential customers. If you have additional complaints, you can reach out to them or you can reach out to the commission staff um, and they will be your advocates. I would just add for immediate help if they are income qualified, we have the Central Missouri Community Action Agency, so they can give LIHEAP funding, which is Low Income Home Energy Assistance Program. It's income qualified, so if you are at the right threshold, they could potentially give them a payment to cover uh, the larger amount that's owed to Ameren. Yes. Yeah, and... Sorry, Lyra, I didn't mean to cut you off. Um, I, thank you for that. Um, I guess as follow-up, uh, if since they said to me in an email that the Public Service Commission was no help to them, um, that just, there is no other recourse besides contacting their legislators. Um, I have Boone Electric myself. I didn't feel this Ameren uh, rate increase. So I just seeking more information on how consumers can be better informed, especially since it was a deregulated market, having a regulated market then make up its cost differences seemed concerning to me. Yeah, so yeah, I'll, I'll just say that, you know, the, the, the tie between the deregulated and the regulated is, you know, uh, because things went so catastrophically bad in Texas, it impacted the price of natural gas everywhere, basically. The largest, and, and we use it to um, plan for utility pricing and, and gas prices, it's called the Henry Hub. And I think it's, I think it's in, it's, it's right in that Gulf area between uh, uh, Louisiana and Texas um, on the border somewhere about there, I can't remember. I think the city might be named Henry, um, but basically that's the hub where a lot of gas comes in and goes through. And the price that's set there uh, basically dictates throughout the country. And so um, because there was very cold weather, people were using a lot of gas everywhere. Um, that was the impact. It wasn't necessarily um, you're paying for the mistake of Texas, but in a way you are. Um, but, you know, it, it, it's kind of a... <laughs> kind of heads you lose, tails you lose, I guess. It, there's, not, there's not a real, um, because there was this failure, we all paid for it, basically. But, but to the recourse, yeah, I mean, if you go through the Public Service Commission, that's the process that we have right now. It's not always um, uh, making everybody happy. Um, and often it leaves everybody disappointed. But, you know, there, that is the due process system that we have for IOUs right now. I would say um, talking to legislators is one way to do it um, if you've got additional recourse. And then Philip mentioned the Community Action Agency. I will say Renew Missouri, we primarily do um, energy efficiency, renewable energy. One thing that we do a lot of also, and this comes from my background as being the consumer advocate at OPC, is we do a lot of low income and um, uh, advocacy for weatherization uh, as a way to save money for customers. 
Uh, we do have kind of a formal agreement with the National Housing Trust. Um, most of that work is done in the St. Louis area or Kansas City area, uh, where we advocate for um, you know, favorable outcomes and different programs to help um, low income uh, customers there and, and try and help them that way. So, so the, we do kind of some of that weatherization and uh, a rearage forgiveness too, but that's not our main focus. I, I feel like we need to get to the rest of your presentation. Uh, Lyric, could you take that yeah, up and sorry. follow up with um, um, the with uh, Renew Missouri on an individual basis, please? Um, yeah, so I'll I'll speed up here and I'll do these very quickly. Um, and James can we can circulate the slide deck if we need. Um, clean energy laws. We've got our net metering act which allows people to put solar on their homes and have it credited against their energy usage. Um, we've got our renewable energy standard, which was by ballot initiative in 2008. Um, electric IOUs have to procure 15% of their energy from renewable resources. Pretty much everybody's met that um, for our IOUs anyway. Uh, the next one is uh, MIA, the Energy Efficiency Investment Act. And I'll, I'll talk briefly a little longer on this. Basically, uh, utilities recover their cost by selling power. That's their commodity. So if they sell less, they make less money. So there is a natural disincentive for them to sell as much power as possible. And from a renewable aspect or climate aspect, that's bad because they're burning more fossil fuels to sell that power, right? So in 2009, uh, and a few years before that, uh, the, the legislature and, and Jay Nixon was instrumental here, uh, put forward uh, the Energy Efficiency Investment Act, which would change that incentive and say, utilities, we're going to allow you to recover some of that money that you would otherwise get by selling power. So in effect, you're paying not to, uh, you're paying the utility to not sell power. But there are some restrictions. It's gotta be beneficial. It's gotta reduce future investment. And so it will have a net benefit to customers. So rather than buying power, you're basically buying efficiency. And that is through programs like weatherization, uh, new light bulbs, um, insulation, uh, HVAC rebates, uh, demand response programs, new thermostat programs, uh, those sort of things. And that's been very successful. All of our electric utilities now have one. Finally, uh, Liberty Empire was the last one to adopt a MIA portfolio. And that was due to just their uh, generation profile that was uh, didn't make it cost effective to do energy efficiency. Uh, Philip, yep, I yep. think I'll, I'll run through it. Slide. Yeah, I'll go through it really quickly. So there are supply side versus demand side resources. So supply side would be on the utility side and what they can do. And demand side would be where you're pulling in the demand. So on our on the customer side and what they can do and, and measures they can take. Uh, one thing we also talk quite a bit about is energy efficiency versus conservation. Energy efficiency is using, it's not changing your behavior. It's you're still using um, power and going about your day how you normally would. You're just using less power because you upgraded uh, your home and you uh, invest in those technologies that Tim just covered um, and, and the different things you can do with HVAC, insulation, LED light bulbs, and so on. And then conservation is just using less. So like um, if I just turn my light off, um, in my office, I would be practicing conservation. If I keep it on and I swap out my incandescent bulb with an LED bulb, that's energy efficiency. Um, energy efficiency is traditionally the lowest cost resource. And that's something we talk about quite a bit. And that's also the point of why in MIA you're paying the utility to not generate because there's actually a cost saving and using efficiency instead. And on the next slide here, we can show you in the chart specifically that dollar amount. So the average a uh, range of cents per kilowatt hour is 3.1 cents. And the lowest there is for energy efficiency versus all of these other um, electric generating um, facilities you could have, such as wind, uh, large solar 
uh, array, natural gas combined cycle plant, a coal plant, a community solar system, or a nuclear plant. Um, and as you can see, it goes up from these various resources. So again, energy efficiency is very cost effective is why we incentivize it. Next slide. So in the Missouri legislature, we have our Republican supermajority. Uh, in the House, there are 114 Republicans, which is supermajority. Uh, Rob Vescovo of O'Fallon uh, is the Speaker of the House. Bill Kidd uh, is the chair of the House Utilities Committee. Um, and he is someone that we have worked with over the years and prior to uh, being the chair. Uh, so that has been fortunate that he has a, a pretty uh, moderate and open view uh, to utilities uh, in, in that role. Then out of the state senators, uh, we have 34 of them, 24 of which are Republican. And as Tim mentioned earlier, there is uh, a little bit of controversy there with the uh, conservative caucus and creating some issues around the districting. So even though they do have the super majority of Republicans in the Senate, it is not um, as easy going as it is on the House side and moving forward and, and making decisions, which could also set up an interesting situation similarly to what Kansas had for a while, where you, you might find agreement between the Democrats and conservative caucus members against the larger group of Republicans and pushing for uh, different um, policies and bills moving forward. So we'll see how that goes. Uh, next slide, please. So each chamber holds a, a veto-proof majority, can override any negative decision that person takes, which doesn't happen very often and hasn't recently. Uh, Republicans cannot control what bills get filed, but they can control which committee bills are referred and whether those bills will get a hearing. They can also control what votes are voted out of committee, get votes on the floor. Bills can be filed as early as December 1st. So far in 2022, nearly 2,000 bills have been submitted, and the deadline for a bill is March 1st. More bills are filed in those days than any time and filing between. And we, we typically say if a bill hasn't been given a hearing by the legislative spring break, it's likely to never go anywhere, is our just rule of thumb that I've seen. And Tim, I'll let you take the rest. I can run through this one. Um, so lower government bills get higher priority and the later they're filed in session, the less likely any action will be taken. Um, as dictated by the state constitution, the session must end at 6 p.m. on May 14th or the third Friday of May. Uh, the state budget must be sent to the Senate from the House the Friday before. And that is the, in the constitution, that must be done. Of all the activities and bills passed, that the state budget has to be completed and part of the process. There's not a mask requirement, nor is there any enforcement of social distancing. As a result, there are a lot of issues with that. Uh, I went to a hearing uh, on Quip earlier this year, and myself and our lobbyists were, along with uh, the lobbyists from uh, Sierra Club, were the only individuals in the room that had a mask on. So uh, for COVID considerations, it's very much not a, a safe or healthy place in how they're conducting themselves. So if you are going to go testify or spend time in there, I would uh, be careful of that. Tim, you're muted. Hello, sorry. Um, so our priorities, um, when we get the, when Renew Missouri looks at things, we do have a limited, um, since we are a nonprofit, we are limited by the amount of lobbying we can do. Um, we definitely can't do it with any of our grants that we get um, typically, but we do have other supporters um, that allow us to dedicate some time to lobbying. Um, and so we look at the bills that are pre-filed, uh, decide what impacts renewable energy. We usually try and push forward uh, at least one or two uh, to get filed that would be advancing renewable energy. But lately, a lot of what we've done uh, is play defense, essentially. Um, and with the Republican supermajorities, that's about what we can do. Um, so a couple bills on our radar this year, um, SB 824 is community solar. Uh, this is one we support, one we've worked on, one we helped draft and tried to get filed. Um, it's basically allows customers who aren't able to put solar on their house 
to participate in owning solar and having it net against their energy usage. Um, it happens in other states. We think it would be great here. Um, as you see by the sponsor, it does have some conservative support. Um, hopefully we can get it across the, the uh, finish line this year. It's gotten close the past few years, hasn't quite got there. Just one comment um, about the legislature. I've been following it for you know a decade. Um, hundreds of bills are filed every year. And if I go back and look at the ones that are truly agreed and signed by the governor, it's usually about 30 to 40 every year is all that gets through. And so you're lucky uh, to get your bill across. But this is one we're hopeful and we really you know, think would be good for people who wanna participate in renewable energy, but maybe live in an apartment or um, you know, don't have a suitable roof uh, or you know, different property for hosting a solar site on their own. Um, you know, so I'd encourage you to call your representative and have them support that. Another one we are watching is SB 820, which we like. It's the uh, Solar Homeowners Bill of Rights, sponsored by Senator Eric Merlison. I believe he's in the Conservative Caucus. Um, and it, it kind of shows how uh, sometimes bipartisan, and, and some of this is the work that James has done and I've done and Philip has done to advance uh, renewable energy is it can be something that some of the, uh, I'll call them the most conservative members of the Republican Party uh, can have an interest in. And so while we might not agree on very much else, um, you know, a, a solar bill of rights would be uh, great if we could agree on that. Um, this one uh, has been around a couple of years. Hopefully we'll get this to the Senate floor soon. Um, this would basically uh, ensure that homeowner associations can't unreasonably prohibit a house from installing solar. Um, I mentioned before, Renew Missouri, and, and I've done it usually, we file the lawsuits against these HOAs and, and we can usually get um, a resolution, but it takes time, it takes money, Lawsuits are hard on the homeowner. Nobody walks away feeling happy. So we feel like this legislation would be really good for um, Missouri. Um, there's some anti-renewable legislation this year. Uh, SB 763, HB 1852, Net Metering Task Force. Basically, these are... Uh, Lawmakers usually supported by rural electric co-ops who don't like uh, net metering. They don't like solar on people's homes. So they uh, want to change the net metering law. We've seen that every year since 2008. So far, we've fought back against it. Hopefully, we can do that again this year. Um, HB 1997 and uh, 2167 SB 10. 14, create a property tax assessment on solar equipment. I will say, I, I know the numbers, I work with the numbers, I work with developers. This would prevent any new solar from being developed, utility scale that is in the state of Missouri. Um, so this is a bad bill. Um, we oppose that. HB 1754 um, by Chuck Basie in Roachport. Uh, is where he's billed out of, I guess, uh, would enact a statewide uh, structure for wind ordinances. Um, and the way he's written it, it would basically ban wind in Missouri. Um, our, we've got some counties that are doing a good job banning it on their own, but Renew Missouri is fighting against that too. Uh, another bill on the radar, this came up earlier. Um, uh, Quip. Um, here's a little background on this slide. 1976, um, there was uh, cost recovery for nukes in advance. Lawmakers have filed bills uh, pretty much every year to try and get rid of it. Um, they do sneak in there or or try and make it seem renewable by saying they will be able to charge for wind or solar um, before that's completed, but um, 
as someone who keeps in mind the ratepayer impact of it, um, really wind and solar are very cheap anyway. Uh, they don't need uh, to have special accounting mechanisms. This is for nukes. Nobody really is trying to build any more nukes in Missouri. And so I don't know what they're doing with it. It will just cause rates to go up. So uh, Renew Missouri opposes it. Hopefully that goes down. Um, some challenges were, this is our last slide. I know I've gone over and I apologize, but um, you know, right now we're gonna see a big bill last year was securitization, which is again, a, an accounting mechanism that will allow utilities to retire their coal plants and sort of take away their disincentive to keep them running or their incentive to keep them running. Um, and it will save customers money. So hopefully we'll see more generation retirements soon. Um, there are um, complications with that. You know, you wanna make sure that we're transitioning and building enough renewables and storage to offset that. Um, but that's something that we're working on now and will be heavily in the future. Um, current planned retirements, Merrimack, which is a Amarin, Missouri plant. Um, there's, uh, that's a natural gas. Sioux should be retired. Labadee was slated to be retired much later than 2024, but there's been some uh, recent litigation uh, out of St. Louis that uh, brought by the EPA that basically they're gonna have to shut it down very soon. So we'll be involved in those cases. Um, and then there's uh, utilities don't like people generating their own power. So that's a challenge because it takes away the money they earn. Um, questions, I see the scholars have a question. Yes, but Nancy Copenhaver really needs to get to ask her question first because oh. she had her hand up before and didn't get a chance. Oh, sorry, I didn't, I didn't see the order they went up. I just looked up. Go basically, ahead. Basically, mine's not a question, but a, a thank you to Jim because uh, 20 years ago, I was uh, in the House of Representatives in my freshman year serving as vice chair of the utilities committee, knew nothing about anything that was going on and was very frustrated because it seemed to me like everybody was in the pocket of the utilities. And other than John Kaufman, who helped me out knowing what I should be doing and what I shouldn't be doing, I really didn't know what I was doing. I learned more today than I did the entire year I spent on that committee. And I really appreciate it. I hope that you can um, inform new young representatives and senators coming onto those committees, especially those that are interested in uh, the consumer, um, so that they will know what they're doing when they get on something like this. And I really thank you for the information you shared with us. I, I appreciate that. And, 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 you know, thank you for what you've done in the legislature. I know the younger ones, and I don't know, she's probably almost termed out right now, but uh, one of the biggest advocates we've had was uh, Tracy McCreary um, out of St. Louis, and she's been on the Utilities Committee for a number of years, and she's been a great advocate. So um, Jill Shoup, Senator Jill Shoup, um, who's, I think she's term limited pretty soon, um, but she was a great advocate for consumers. Um, so th there are a number that come along, um, and it's definitely complicated and accounting heavy. So appreciate anyone who is willing to listen. And, you know, thank you all for, for being interested in it. Carl and Mari. Could I just say something? I, nobody sees my hand. Um, I, I was, wanted to thank you for, uh, thank for New Missouri for uh, defense of solar owners. As a solar owner, you, you know, help protect me by keeping those extra charges the some of the legislators want to put and discourage people from putting solar on. So I, I appreciate that work and your work on to keep the crane belt wind power transmission line going too. So lots of good work. Thank you. Thank you. Carl and Mari. Yeah, okay. Um, as, a, as a card carrying member of this choir, 
uh, <laughs> that, that, that you're you're preaching to um uh, and and the community development that you you referred to I'm, I'm a little dismayed by the comment about being doubtful about some of the politics of all this and obviously as a city representative I would do whatever I can to encourage as much uh, you know individual solar and so on and, and community solar as possible some of these things are a real challenge to that we're always facing on the city council this uh, this uh, uh, a problem with preemption with state preemption and there there's a whole panoply of, of, of bills to, to gut a lot of the progress that we've made with respect to some of what we're trying to accomplish. Any suggestions uh, from you um, to what the city council can do uh, in terms of uh, continuing to support community solar and perhaps net metering and, and all the rest of it uh, that goes with this uh, uh, tremendous opposition and frankly, the profit motive um, to discourage uh, individual uh, compliance with uh, climate change reasonableness. Yeah, thank you. Um, so, uh, and and I, I apologize if I offended you. I didn't mean to. Some way, I know the city of Columbia has been a leader in a number of ways. No, no, um, no way. I, I can't be offended anymore. <laughs> it's just. Uh, the, well, that's good. <laughs> so we, uh, yeah. So um, you know. Most of what I do is is our litigate as our general counsel is our litigation, and then I do our advocacy for the Public Service Commission. I have um, I do advise James and and Philip and and the rest of our staff on ordinances and things like that. Um, there are um, programs that are developed um, in in certain cities that encourage sort of community solar developments. I, I will say the City of Columbia has. Uh, well, they've got the Truman Solar Field that they've signed up, uh, which is out by the old Ashley Furniture Building. I think it's a equipment chair now. They've got another one that's being constructed north of town, I think east of 63 and north of 70. Um, so they are taking tremendous steps to source more of their power from um, renewable resources. Uh, you know, Philip can probably speak to some of their planning right now. I know there was comments before we started about getting to clean by getting to 100% renewable by 2030. And, you know, some of these, and Columbia is facing it, and I know cities throughout the country are, they've got long-term contracts, you know, 20, 30, 50 year contracts to purchase coal um, and power from companies that use coal or natural gas. So that's one issue. But, you know, one thing that I've thought about um, in terms of what local communities can do um, to encourage or at least to not discourage renewable development is um, I think there's, uh, Iowa has some good, some good laws that um, could be translated to ordinances about basically if you're a development or a homeowner association, you need to have um, reasonable, if you have any restrictions on a customer generating their own power, such as solar panels, it's only, it can only be a reasonable one. You can't just say total ban. Um, I think that there could be some opportunity there in Columbia to do that. I think that there could be some in Boone County to do that, um, particularly with a lot of our, um, you know, housing developments that are being built. I mean, I live on a farm outside of town and and every day it seems like the neighborhoods get a little closer to me. So I know there's all kinds of houses coming up. Um, and I think that there could be some, um, you know, restrictions or ordinances that say, look, if you're building a new subdivision, um, you can't do it without, uh, you can't do it with a ban on solar. I mean, those are just little things, but um, there are definitely opportunities that kind of, um, come up because if there is a city ordinance or a county ordinance that says you can't ban solar in your neighborhood association, um, I still might have to file a lawsuit, but it makes it my lawsuit easier to win. You know, so, I mean, there's, and, and those are areas where it's unlikely that the legislature will preempt you. 
I mean, I know they've done it on, what have they done it on minimum wage? They've done it on uh, plastic bag bans. They've done it on probably a whole host of things. But, um, you know, there are, there are regulation and zoning to be more permissive of renewable resources would be a big step forward. I think Boone County and Columbia could be leaders on that. Um, you know, the, the city has been great. The county has been um, atrocious, is my personal could, opinion. Could you maybe send um, or post in the chat if it's handy or else maybe just email to Carl the, the law that you were speaking of? The Iowa statute? Yeah, I yeah. will make a note here. Let me, uh, it, it, I don't have it handy um, and I don't know how to close out of my presentation without hanging up. So I'm making a note on a piece of paper here um, and I will send that to, uh, I, I'm sure we have your information. We'll send that along uh, on solar. Okay. Um, yeah, so I, I hope that's helpful. I mean, that's just one thing off the top of my head. But um, I am sympathetic to the idea that you try and do good and then somebody comes down and knocks you down and, <laughs> and you just got to keep, keep uh, pushing that boulder up the mountain, you know? Yeah, and I'll, I'll just add, I uh, put it in the chat here, but Columbia Water and Light is uh, a leading municipal utility in my view on what we've done proactively and voluntarily in terms of supporting energy efficiency and renewable energy programs and uh, beat the IOUs, our big investor in utilities and offering the solar rebate program and having our renewable energy standard well before any of them were required to do that themselves. So, I, I mean, we've really shown a lot of other utilities on how they can operate. And one thing, I want to just soapbox on really briefly is a program called pay as you save that Ameren and Evergy are currently offering to their customers. It's really good for low income customers. Uh, it finances many different energy efficiency investments and has a requirement that the customer will be getting a benefit. Uh, there's a 20% savings requirement uh, from immediate requirement from any upgrades they get. Uh, and that will be 20% above the charge they will get from the pay as you save financing program. So that's something that we could do. There hasn't been uh, an example with a municipal utility anywhere in the country. There are co-ops that have done it. There are investor-owned utilities that have done it, uh, but we could be the first. And I also see potential for it to have a solar financing component in the future, uh, but that will take some time because really Hawaii is the only state that has looked at it. And that's primarily due to their energy efficiency not really being there because it's an island that has wonderful weather most of the time. So they don't have the, you know, really cold snowy days like we had yesterday out there. So the efficiency savings don't exist while the solar panels for them can be, you know, pretty good. So I will leave you with that. Nancy had a request that you uh, ha let us have a list of the bills that you're watching. Give me your email. I will email you, and then you can email that back to me if you'll just say your email right now. Uh, sure. So for all of ours, uh, just our first name. So mine's Philip, P-H-I-L-I-P, at renew, R-E-N-E-W-M-O dot O-R-G. Same thing for Tim, just Tim at renewmo.org. And then for James, James at renewmo.org. And um, he likely already has this ready to go. Um, so I will ask him if he can get that to you. Okay. Tim, for Tim. Okay. I will email Tim and then, then you'll have my email to send it back to me. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, James tries to send these to our supporters regularly. So um, if, if you email Tim at renewmo.org or um, okay. James at renewmo.org, we will get you that information. Okay. And I just wanted to comment you're in the same building as the Democrats. We're, we're neighbors. Uh, yes, we are uh, just up the, just in that first door. It used to be the laborers mm -hmm. Mayuna, under us. Right. Um, and so they, uh, it, it's, uh, it's been a good building for us. I was there today and I had to leave because my, our office printer is uh, atrocious and I had to print something. So I, <laughs> I'm zooming from home today. Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, it's, it, thank you for letting us talk today. Um, and I appreciate the questions and, um, and, and the, the service and information you all provide to the community.
Well, Tim and Philip, thank you so and much. Philip, for you could send. Go ahead. I wanted to ask Philip if he could also send the podcast link to um, Pam to yes. put in the yeah. email. Yeah, I'll make sure we do that as well. James is very fond of getting that to folks, so I'm sure he would love uh, more listeners to check it out. Okay, thanks. Yeah, appreciate it. a lot of good information today. Appreciate that. We have gone way over, but but it was it was good information. Thank you everyone for your patience. Uh, just remember to come back next week when we're having a panel discussion between our two candidates for third ward city council. And with that, I'll say goodbye. See you all.